What is up everybody? Welcome to my first deck basics video. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with who I am, my name is Lockin, and today we are gonna be doing a deck basics or just you know a breakdown video and just starting it off with the number one deck in the meta right now. Dig on with whatever variation of weather you feel like running. So just gonna get right into what this uh what this is, just gonna jump right into the whole deck basics and gonna break it down for you guys. So this is a list that I believe the title was uh, Johan Lieber, Lieber. I'm not actually familiar with him, uh, but he took it to rank one uh, global. I looked at the list. I kind of adjusted it for what I was facing against. I kind of put in some cards I felt would be good in the deck, and we got this. And so we're just going to go real quick over it, talk about the cards, what makes them good, and we may get a little bit into some theory on what makes cards good versus bad, and I'll try to keep it short for you guys. First card I put in here, just uh, the easiest decision, Woodland Spear. This card's just freaking crazy. It's at like the very least guaranteed to be 10 power. Uh, you get your three wolves, that's three power. You got the five on the body. You got the minus two off the fog. Bare minimum, this card's giving you 10 power. Then on top of the fact that you run three foglets in most Dagon lists, it's 16 power. Even if they clear the foglets in the weather, you still got your two off the fog. You got the three off the wolves and the five off the spirit. Crazy card, you just got to run it in Dagon lists, pretty straightforward. Uh, up next, the next card I figured was best to put in here was Spear Tip. This card also really good in the metagame. So many decks nowadays want to just swarm the board, make predictable plays with where they're putting their minions, and even though agile units are starting to get more and more common, people are running out of places to put them. So what do you do? You run Old Spear Tip. And this guy also, very, very high value. Uh, just right off the bat, we're looking at him. He's a 7 value when he gives the boosted units adjacent to this unit by 1. He's 7 values because of his 5 body. He upgrades to 10 when he transforms. So that's 12 value. And he can deal up to 2. We'll just go ahead and zoom in for you guys. He can deal up to 2 damage to... Or sorry, he can deal 2 damage to up to 5 enemies. Sorry. That's also pretty crazy value. I mean, we're talking about what can, he, what can give you up to 22 value. So obviously a really good card. One of the better cards I thought to put in here. We were getting into some tougher decisions, but I still felt like Caranthir was a solid card. Caranthir moving in 11 value just right off the bat. Uh, the move three enemies to this unit's row is actually trickier to use than people think. Using it at the right time can actually win you games sometimes. I find a lot of value with this card. I think it pairs incredibly well with cards like Water Hag and Lacerate. So really, Caranthir, in my opinion, is at least giving you some sort of value. You know, a lot of decks in this metagame will run things like Blue Stripe Scouts, or they'll run Arch Griffins, or they'll run Brigades, they'll run Mercenaries, but they usually only run two tops, three Weather Clears. And so what I love about this list, and the reason I'm running Caranthir on top of it, is you've got Woodland Spirit, you've got Caranthir, you've got... Impenetrable Fog, Impenetrable Fog, and you've got Dagon. You've got five weather uh, units that can just really disrupt the board. I think weather is still a phenomenal card. I don't think it's broken. I think it's incredibly healthy now, and it's not game-breaking, which I'm glad to see. But I think it's still incredible in Dagon, because as long as you can run Foglets, and as long as this has the versatility that it does on a six-statted hero, he's just going to be crazy. So we're just abusing that while we can in High Elo. Uh, up next, the final gold card for me, and this was tricky. Uh, I went back and forth on this one for a long time, uh, but once I switched to Geralt Igni, uh, my win rate actually went up by about 8%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but over about 60 games, 8% is a big deal. And Geralt Igni, uh, I switched him from Caretaker. I was trying Caretaker, and as Queensguard uh, Skellige uh, slowly became less popular, and as a lot of... Uh, more graveyard heavy or just like decks that I could abuse. Uh, using Caretaker, I found it to be less valuable. I, I kept getting Caretaker to be anywhere from 12 to 16 value, which isn't terrible, but I was honestly finding better ways to use Geralt Igni with just my massive amount of weather effects. I found so many ways to set up uh, Igni to do crazy things, using Caranthir to move things around in rows, Lacerate Waterhag. You have so many ways to activate Geralt Igni. I think you just have to play this card, in my opinion. I think the card is still busted. It's got phenomenal card art, got great text, very thematic, all-in-all all phenomenal card. You can't ask for much more. I think you got to play it. 
Uh, moving down to the silvers now, I just got six of those, pretty standard. Um, this is a personal choice of mine, and I don't see it run a lot. I think carryover is busted. I think the round system inherently means carryover is crazy, so I play Olgird. You get him down in round one, crazy. He's just going to give you 15 power. Honestly, you don't even ask for 15 power from your gold sometimes. Sometimes you're okay getting less. Old geared, crazy value making get him. He's either going to get locked, or he's going to have to be allowed to just generate you value every single round. Until carryover is not crazy, I'm going to keep playing this. Even if people aren't running it in their top tier lists, ever since I found uh, started running old geared, it's been honestly crazy. And we're going to get more into carryover in a second, but first let's keep going with what we got here. Uh, up first, or now up first, up second, is the crones. They're crazy. I mean, everyone knows how strong the witchers are. Everyone knows that if you can't play crones, you play witchers in decks like this, and these more mid rangey value decks. But honestly, there's not a lot to say about these. Uh, as long as you can keep them from screwing up your mulligan, they're crazy cards. I mean, we're talking 20 value. We're talking one of the best finishers in the game outside of Queensguard. Uh, honestly, not even Tybor is as strong as these as a finisher go. Uh, if you're smart with your mulligans and you're not too unlucky, you can avoid, for the most part, getting all three of these or even all two of them or you know, two of the three in your hand, and you can just get crazy finishers. Sometimes you can even play them on round one and hard pass and go two cards up on the round. All in all, really, really good cards. I'd highly recommend it. Um, Water Hags up next. Again, the reason that this sees play is it's so incredibly versatile. Uh, the versatility of cards should not be overrated. Agile is a really, really strong effect compared to cards that have to stay in one place. Uh, cards that can be played at any moment for versatility, which is kind of what the reason that these golds are all solid, is they have a lot of uses. You don't have to play them at certain points. All very good. Water Hag, the exact same thing. Water Hag is rarely going to get you less than 10 value, whether it's a clutch clear skies in the mirror matchup, whether it's a lacerate against a consume deck to wipe out all those annoying arrakises, anything. Honestly, this card I've found to be really, really good. I've messed around with a lot of other silvers in here. At one point, before I was running Igni, I tried cutting this to run a Scorch even, and again, just I think the Water Hag is just too consistently valuable, and I think you got to play uh, the next one is Frightener. Again, same thing. Spies are crazy powerful. Uh, if you're not playing a Spy in your deck, I, I think it's a mistake. Uh, spies, again, card advantage, inherently a big deal in the round system. And there's no way that that's ever going to get nerfed, because there's always got to be a round system. So what are you going to do? Well, you play Frightener, and you, or you play, you know, Yaven, or you play uh, Thaler. You know, you've just got to play these Spy units, or you're just inherently putting yourself at a disadvantage. Not usually too relevant, but his deploy can set up Gerald Igni relatively well, can set up your Lacerates and your, your Spear Tips. It's not usually relevant, but in those niche scenarios where it is, you I actually have found it incredibly useful. But for the most part, the deploy is not all that relevant, but you just play because of the card advantage it generates. If you can win the round one, you can drop it round two and go even further up on your opponent. There's just so many situations where Frightener gives you just a ton of value. Uh, moving on to the bronzes, just real quick, we're going to speed up on these. Fog, obviously paired with Foglets, is crazy. Minimum thins your deck by 3, gives you an 8 value. From the numbers I've been running, I usually get about 10 to 11 value on each Fog, uh, rough estimate. That's not even taking into account the fact that Foglets thin your deck, which I would put at about a ha half value, essentially, in terms of uh, just advantage to be given. So, in my opinion, with the Fog, I'm getting roughly 10 to 11 value per Fog, just because the first one is usually cleared relatively quickly, but they rapidly run out of uh, fog as the round goes on, and it quickly accrues value. It's one of those things where, even though the first one may only net you six, even four points if they clear really quickly, maybe even only two, and you're going to say, well, a two power bronze is garbage, I've found that the second one usually sticks the whole rest of the round, or if not, then the third one gets them. Maybe the fourth one gets them, or maybe your frost gets them, and you can quickly see how this deck overwhelms people, because it's just almost impossible to run just that many weather clears because it just makes your matchups complete garbage against the other decks. Uh, obviously Foglets I think are just crazy. Like I said, uh, being able to thin your deck in my opinion is like an extra just half, uh, just like an extra half power on the board. It makes your, uh, your, your choices better. You don't have to run as much garbage so you can guarantee that you're drawing cards you want to be playing. Up next, the Harpies again. Until carryover is addressed or somehow adjusted, it's crazy. The same exact reason I run Ekimara. Ekimara, I tried a lot of different bronzes in this unit. I tried three Arch Griffins when I was seeing a lot of other monsters. Found it a little overkill. I found it not good enough. Just 
a, a lot of things came together and I thought, you know what, I'm already running all this carryover, I'm running all geared, what if I just run an Ekimara? What if I just eat one of the eggs that this guy spawns? What if I just eat all geared sometime? I know he's coming back in the second round either way. And it's three base power is obviously underwhelming and drawing it and just like top decking it in the third round on the mulligan is really sad. But in the un the other times when you actually draw it, it's a nine power play when you play it with Tarpy, and that's good enough, and it's nine power, but it has carrier, which is like 18 power. And this has honestly been a really good card, and I would highly suggest uh, teching it in. Uh, I think it's almost always going to be a good card. Obviously, you don't want too many. It doesn't really fit with your game plan, but having this nice carryover backup is always an excellent idea. Uh, an argument I could see being made is if you're going to go carryover, why not run uh, the, the golems? And my answer to that is the golems give inherently two less carryover value than the harpies. The golem itself is a little underwhelming when you play it. So when you play the harpies, you kind of understand that you're taking a loss at tempo to gain more in the long run. But the elementals are weird because you play them and you try to keep tempo, but you don't get as much back later. But I think trying to be in that middle niche isn't as good as just going all in on tempo or all in on carryover. And I think that's why Earth Elemental isn't nearly as good as the Harpy. Obviously, also the fact that the Harpy spreads its stats out over three minions makes it uh, not as uh, prone to the single target removal. Uh, the fact that the carryover is over two eggs also means it's a lot harder for the opponent to punish and block your carryover. So you can see how this is obviously better. And like I said, Ekimara with the consume on the eggs. This synergizes incredibly well. You can eat your Olgeard to make this 12 carryover. Olgeard comes back as a 4. And now suddenly you start the round with 16 carryover power. Or 19 because of the extra egg. And that's assuming you don't even have any of these. You've thinned your deck because of the Foglets. Or you've thinned them because of these. We've got Thunderbolt potions because they're crazy with the Wolves, the Foglets, the 3 units that these spawn. We run a Lacerate just on top of it because I think it's just a good meta call most of the time. And the last one that you can honestly make your own decision on is Meridrome. It's the same with the uh, Lacerate. Honestly, never been good at pronouncing this. I'm not going to even bother trying to fix it now. But these two cards uh, are honestly up to Medical. You, if you really wanted, uh, you could convince me to tech in a Blood Curdling Roar or an Arrakis Venom. The reason I play Lacerate is simple. If Lacerate can get four targets on a row, it becomes just as good as Arrakis Venom. And anywhere up from there is worth it. And for me, only being able to Lacerate three minions for nine value is worth it for the number of times where I can lacerate for 18 or 20 value, whereas this card is always going to be max 12 value and oftentimes less, just because it might not even have three adjacent units. And so the consistency of this to me is not worth the overall power that this can represent. And the reason I run this is because it's honestly, I think, just always a good idea to have one of these uh, worst case scenario. You can always play it on one of your guys that are getting hit by weather. You can play it on something of theirs that's gotten really out of control. It's very, very good into, uh, honestly, just about any deck. I mean, a lot of decks run finishers that are vulnerable to this, uh, whether it's like Duet uh, from Nilfgaard, whether it's uh, in insane hand-buffed cards from Squiatel, whether it's Dwarves. Uh, honestly, against Dwarves, this will just win you the game. Against Pirate Captains, it's still crazy. I don't think this is relevant when you could be playing these. Overall, I just think this is a really well-rounded deck, and that every card in this deck just really represents an insane amount of value. So with that, guys, I'm going to go ahead and send it to the game footage, and thanks for you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next Deck Basics video. Classic CD Project Red server it issues. Is how I punish those who so that, that was a little disappointing, truth be told. But what are you, you going to do? Foglet, Foglet. Obviously, we blacklist both of the Foglets, or we only have to blacklist one, that's the way it works. But we get rid of both of them, obviously, anyway. We look here and we see, is there anything that we really want in this matchup? Having the Griffins isn't bad for when he plays uh, his Adepts. Uh, having a Crone, obviously, always not a bad plan. Having Olgeard, also just good. Thunderbolt Potion, not bad. Um... We can afford to be a little bit more aggressive, so we could try to get a uh, Caranthir or another Silver, perhaps. In which case, we can throw this back, because if we pull another Crone, 
we'll have another shot to get rid of it anyway, so I think it's okay. So yeah, it doesn't end up mattering. We'll see what he does here. Uh, one of the cards that I used to run was Fiend, because it's pretty good against uh, Radovid decks, because you can counter whatever they lock of yours, and I find it was pretty good for counter-locking Olgird, which Radovid obviously is pretty good at. Um, Control Radovid, one of my least favorite decks. I think it's incredibly easy to play. I think it's incredibly unfun to play against, and I just think it's an unhealthy deck. I honestly think this deck is incredibly easy to pilot, has very little decisions it has to make, and playing against it almost provides zero interaction. And I, so I think it's unhealthy for the game. And I would be perfectly fine if the deck never Long saw live, etc., etc. But again, that's just my opinion. Cards like this destroy weather decks for sure. It's very sad when I see this. So, we can Old Geared, or we can Harpy. And right now I'm leaning towards Harpy to try and bait out anything he might want to do. But that's not exactly a given turn. The upside is that if we Harpy, we kind of protect ourselves against Yin a little bit. He denies our carryover, but he makes our round one stronger. And we honestly don't mind you winning wish, uh, that round. I may let him just do this, to be honest, for the time being. I'll let this go off, and then I'll clear it. I will see if he maybe plays another one. I don't know if we mind all that much. <sighs> Doubt I'll ever pay off these school loans. I was hoping, obviously this is one of the reasons I wanted the water hag, but it's not too big of a deal. Let's go ahead and just do this here. The next weather card he plays will be his final weather card, so we'll have successfully outlasted the weather, which is game which is step one against this deck. Uh, don't get destroyed by their their weather. There'll be nothing to pick up when I'm done with you. Okay, so we're not as protected as I would have liked, obviously. Um, so yeah, that's a little disappointing. Um, I think now is as good of time as any to to play Old Geared. He has, quite honestly, nothing on the board that he can uh, or that he wants to be playing Radovid against alongside this. So it's quite good for us. Um, the other thing worth considering is I could play Dagon and fog the back row, but for the time being, I, mean, no I, think I like suggests. doing this. Obviously, he can pass, yada yada. Um, right now, kind of our game plan is if he keeps trying to play around this, um, I may end up just playing Marjoram and trying to reset it. Uh, the other game plan right now is we have two you options. Like a swine in that we can go for a very, very long uh, round two and try to <sighs> get, get him to Not play his answers. Okay, we're just going to Arch Griffin snap uh, just to shut down this. Anyway, we have options in round two for how I want to do it. If we think we can bleed him out of good cards in round two, we can play that, try to get him to play all of his answers, and then make it so in round three he can only play Bloody Baron or the Letter 10 Mirth, or we can have a really short round two and then just in round three have a really long round three and just say, do whatever you want, uh, but that's not going to even matter against us. Okay, now we're starting to get into the nitty gritty. This is starting to get tricky. Igni does not have a lot of value in this matchup. So, Igneing for 6 to deny Aquist value doesn't seem bad. Um, 4, 6, 10, 16, 22, 23. So, if we play the Fog and then Igni, we would hit this, this, and this, and we would double the value we get off of it. So, let's try that, because I think that's actually not a bad turn. Let's try it. Right? I'm not, I'm not just a complete freaking idiot. 4, 6, 10, 16, 17, 21. I don't think I am. Pretty sure I did the math on this. Completely right. 
we Igni, and we kill 12 worth of power, and we deny any sort of Aquist value. I feel like we did this right every time. Um, Redovid can actually lock Foglets. So if he locks this and this, he is shutting down a decent amount of power, which is one of the reasons I hate Redovid with this deck. Uh, it is a tough matchup, in my opinion. Um, Valen is not super dangerous for us. But it is still scary, for sure. Okay, so he's going to go in to on this line. With him. Um, whoa. That, sir, is a misplay. I'm not mistaken. I'm pretty sure... Yes. Uh, he could have prevented this from being resurrected. So he just actually did misplay there by a lot. That would... Yeah, okay. Um, we set this up last turn, so this is a snap decision. We set that up to burn 12 value. We deny his Octus value. Octus is not only a good card for giving you, uh, you know, just card advantage because the Octus comes back to your hand, but it is a nice board swing a lot of the times. But yeah, that's where we are. I think we set that up well. Um, he did just like I said, misplay. Now, now we have a choice where we are up by 21. Chironex will die. So we are up by 22. What card could this deck play that is worth 22? I guess 20, because this will take two more if he wants to. I can think of no card that this plays that is worth 20. Bloody Baron's not even worth 20 yet. Roach is 6. 6. 12, 15, you know what, Roach will do it, so we're going to do this. I started thinking about Roach, and then I was like, you know what, fuck it, I don't want to, I don't want to get shit on by Roach. So just to be safe, we'll go full defense. Full defense, even if he was going to pass either way, just in case he has a crazy Roach play, because Roach spawns three, does three, so he could have gone, Roach is eight, eleven, 13, 16, this takes two more, 18, maybe my math was just stupid, yeah, okay, my math was dumb and he still couldn't have swung that much, whoops, but we played an extra card, I don't know where we're wrong on my math, I doubled what Roach was doing at one point, I don't know why, It's it's been a long day, I haven't been asleep yet, it's 10am, it's definitely been a weird day, uh, yeah, give me a break, ooh, but, uh, you hate to see that, you hate to see the double croon draw when you really want to see the Frightener. Eh. I just kind of want a hard pass. So this card's not doing much for me, truth be told. But then we ask ourselves, how do we win a third round? So his game plan is Villain, kill anything of value. So he Villains, kills valuable stuff, and then uses Bloody Baron to win. Bloody Baron is going to be like a 1925 roughly power, anywhere in there. So how do we beat that? Can, the Crones alone can't. And he will burn us for 8, so we need other things. In which case, we want a long round. But we could just throw these away, because they have very little application in the long run. But we'd be throwing a card away for nothing, because it's only 3 power. We get ahead of that with the other one, so we pass, I think. This is a tricky, tricky game plan. Um, going for a long round against Radovid can be good, and sometimes you, you, you can get punished really, really hard if he has all the right answers. For Radovid! That's a card I haven't actually seen them run for a while. But, so be it. Alright. Now, we go... Ooh... Okay, well, we really, we've got nine cards, and only one of them is a crone. So, 11% to not just lose the game. I'll take it. I mean, those are pretty good odds, but I've seen, I've definitely seen some, some crazier shit. I hoped to, I was hoping to not draw a crone so I could get rid of this Ekimara, because its value is now bad. This is what I've talked about, uh, briefly about Ekimara, is sometimes the cards is bad. Now. And I can't obviously do anything about this card, because, uh... The fog is obviously shit against it. 
Um, we can just throw the Echo Mara away to stall for another turn to try to do something. Which seems to be pretty good, I think. Don't really want to play this yet. Yeah, I don't think we want to be playing any consume or anything. I don't think we want to be making. I don't think we really want to be making like giant units. Basically, we want to wait till he plays Valin, and then what we'll do is we'll actually just supercharge his knight so he kills it. And that seems like a good game plan, truth be told. He's already played Yennefer, so he can't do anything crazy with her. Um, he hasn't played the Baron or Valin, but those are finishers. As for gold, I don't know what his fourth gold could be. I see a lot of people arguing for different things. I think your fourth gold should be rich, but I've also been wrong a lot before. Hmm. Well, I would sort of like to just stop that, but I also can't really. If I lacerate, it doesn't really do anything. It's the interesting part. He may choose to hold his Valen too, which is also interesting. So I could actually Torrential Rain and slowly work this thing down. Boosts that by one. I like that actually. We're gonna just do it. See the way this works is we damage this by one, so when he will buff this by one. But, if I had lacerated, this would get buffed by 2 anyway. So we use the Torrential Rain, and we just sort of slowly try to work this thing's armor down. As you command, Your Majesty. Ah, oh, really? Damn, I thought we had some, uh, the next level mind gameplay. Darn. Oh well. Well, that's, that's really all we can do. So he's just gonna, he's, he's just gonna get to buff that. We just gotta deal with it. We take whatever weather value we can get right now, and we see if he plays Valin. If he plays Valin, then, I mean, it's kind of a dead card, because it's obviously going to be the thing it's going to hit. Boy, he is just about to make a crazy, oh no, I was going to say, I thought he was going for like the full, just insane power uh, dude, but he's, he's not going for it, alright. Well, this is going to boost this by two, it doesn't, but it is going to hit these, and I'm kind of digging that, so. And I like taking the armor off this while we still can, but it is by no means a great play. We are in an awkward situation, but he's going to play the Bloody Baron. We're going to play this for 20, so it's going to pretty much cancel out. If he plays a Valin card... Yeah, uh, our finisher is actually better as of right now. God, the freaking fog is just so worthless for me here. But I think I still play it. Obviously not there, but I think I do it like this. Alright. Oh, well, actually, I'm kind of stupid. Uh, Valen is still obviously 8 power for him. I didn't think about that. Uh, he, just, he just plays it last so the effect doesn't go off. But uh, the Crones is still 20 power and will still win if all he has is Valen. If he has Valen, he goes to 44. We play this for 20, and we go to 46, and we win by 2. And we win in spite of our admittedly somewhat uh, misjudged torrential rain play, in which, and where I, uh, yeah... So, or was that last? I, no, I've I'm played. A I, tend to know what I'm doing when I, prescribe I have played quite a bit of Gwent and Hearthstone today. Well then, let's get to work. Holy shit! Holy shit! Did you really have to think that long about it and give me that false hope? Damn. Well, we should have held this then. I thought for sure he was holding like an Igni or something. Damn, I'm really sad now. Here, we'll just mind game this guy and just like throw our card around. Ooh, we could still win this game. Damn. 
Could we have won? Gotta hand it to you. Good work. Yeah, if we had gone crone. But there's no way. People never play Shawnee in their fucking Radovid control. I don't think my decision making was bad. I think assuming that his last card was some sort of a burn effect was the right uh, decision, was the right thing to play around by holding the crone. In which case, if we hadn't held the crone uh, and it was a Geralt Digny, we would have lost, which I think is far more likely in his Radovid control. Well, we lost, but I, uh, I still think that shows the. I can. Uh, it's full. Uh, it's full glory, and I honestly think that even though that is, in my opinion, one of the worst matchups in the game for that deck, just because of how little you can interact with their board, the fact that we were inches away from winning, and if my opponent had played a little bit more of a traditional style that I expected him to play, we would have won. I still think that kind of shows the power of the deck. I don't think that means that the uh, the deck is bad by any means just because we lost. I definitely don't think my decision to hold the card, because I assumed it was a Scorch effect, was wrong. Just because I didn't, just because it punished me and I didn't win because of it. Because I don't think we should be results oriented in what we do. But that was close.